Good afternoon. Welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center. We're so excited that you're here today, and we are so excited to be joined by NASA astronaut Christina Cook. Christina just returned from a 328-day mission aboard the International Space Station, the longest mission ever by a woman for a single space flight, and she just got back to Earth last Thursday. She's here with us today to answer your questions. First off, Christina, is there anything you'd like to share? Well, first off, thanks to everyone who is here. Thank you for your interest in telling the story. It's been my honor to be a part of it, and I can tell you that after 328 days in space, the first six days back on Earth were full of just as much wonder and excitement. So we all live on a great planet, and it's great to be back. Nice to be with you today. Thank you. I know you have a lot of questions for Christina, so we'll get right to it. We'll take questions here in the room, on the phone, and then um, on social media. So if you're on the phone and you have a question, please press star one to ask your question and star two to withdraw your question if it's already been answered. On social media, you can ask questions using hashtag AskNASA. All right, we'll start here in the room. Please raise your hand if you have a question. And um, when I call on you, state your name and affiliate and wait for the mic to get to you. All right, we have one right here. Hi, uh, Sean Ben Chow, KHOU Houston. So what's the first thing you did once you were free to do something outside of NASA constraints? And what's your most uh, vivid memory that you take away from your time on the ISS? Well, the first thing that I did after I went home was to reunite with my dog, which was wonderful. Uh, it was, she was very excited. And then we took a family trip to the beach. So got to take in some of the sights, sounds, and you know, uh, feelings of just being back near the ocean and some of those things that I miss so much. While in space, it's almost impossible to pick just one moment. There were so many overwhelming moments. But the one that really comes to mind is the first moment that I arrived at the space station. Having learned about the space station for so many years, having it, you know, regarding it as this amazing place where we're doing awesome science to benefit the Earth, a one-of-a-kind laboratory, and to see that it was really real, to sort of meet my new home for the next year was an incredible feeling. It was like something that had been discussed and trained on for so many years was actually come to life. And not only that, but I got to float around in that place, and that'll just be something I'll never forget. All right, Mark. Oh, thank you, uh, Mark Carrow with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, I'm wondering what advice you might offer to someone preparing for their first long duration mission based on your experience to help them prepare mentally, physically, whatever you think would be uh, at the top of the list. Thank you. You know, that's a great question because it's something I haven't really thought a lot about. I've thought a lot about what I would tell future space explorers in general, but the long duration aspects of the mission, I was fortunate. I had some people that mentored me and they got in touch with me and gave me some advice, Scott Kelly, Peggy Whitson, and a lot of their advice was pace yourself, do the things that you love, make sure that you're in it for the long haul. We have a saying here that we say it's a marathon, not a sprint, and we used to say it's an ultra marathon, not a marathon for my time up there, and that is really true taking it one day at a time, making sure that you recognize that even though there will be times when it feels like time is passing slowly, your, your time up there is special. One thing that I learned during both deployments in Antarctica and on the space station was to constantly focus on the things you have that you'll never have again rather than the things you don't have. And I think that's a lesson in life that can be helpful, and it definitely helps up there for a long duration. And it helps you to recognize every day how special what you have is, which then in turn makes you feel like you need to bring your best to sort of meet that every single day. And that's really what it's about, thinking about how you can give back every day rather than what you're missing out on. All right, Robert, and then we'll go over here. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com and Space.com. I'm wondering if there was a point um, into the mission that, uh, that the International Space Station stopped feeling like a place that you were working with a cot set up in the corner or, um, or that you were on an expedition, but that it actually felt like home. And then on the flip side, coming home and you having to pack to come home. I know you can't take a lot of stuff on the Soyuz, but as you were emptying your, your living space, did you find that you had squirreled away things over that 328 days? Um, and was there anything that you particularly did want to bring back to Earth? 
Well, there definitely was a point at which it started to feel like home, and that actually came pretty quickly into the mission. I would say only about three months in is where I started to sort of feel at home there. The different things that we do throughout our daily life seem normal to me. You know, not using a cup to have a drink of water and filling up food packets and things like that. So all of that really started to feel normal, even floating. I jokingly say that I kind of forgot I was floating until a new crew would come and they would be so excited about floating, I would think, I guess we are floating, aren't we? Um, so it was really neat to see that transition. Um, in terms of packing, it's true. When you live somewhere for a year, you find that you have things in every nook and cranny. So about a month before I started to come back, I started to sort of draw in my footprint on the space station and sort of things I had squirreled away in the galley for, you know, my favorite little tidbits for a meal. I started sort of getting rid of those and recognizing, okay, I may not need that for the next month. And pretty soon, towards the end of the time it was ready to go, I had everything packed up. We take very, very little on the Soyuz, like you mentioned. So everything else kind of went back and what would be the equivalent of about a shoebox sized. And that was really enough to kind of carry it all. The most Im important things to me that I brought to space were things for my friends and family, mementos that they can take with them and remember that I carried them with me and that they lived without them for a year while they were sort of, you know, in my um, in my care and orbiting Earth. So bringing that, those things back was probably my number one most important thing. All right, over here. Erica Simon with ABC 13. Uh, first and foremost, how are you feeling? Like just kind of mentally and physically. And then I have a fun question. You mentioned chips and salsa from Galveston. Can you let us in on where this lovely place is that you like chips and salsas from? Well, um, for the first question, I feel great. I'm really fortunate. A lot of people, because of the different neurovestibular system things and changes that go on for microgravity, when you're readapting to 1G and to Earth, you might experience some motion sickness and things like that. I'm really fortunate in that I have not experienced that. But what I have noticed is that my balance has taken a little while to get used to. So the physical act of walking was something to get used to. But I'm feeling great. I think just the all of the new things that I'm experiencing, sort of you, you you see your mind wake up to the sensory experiences that define Earth and the things that are here. You know, within the first two minutes of being back on Earth, I saw more people's faces than I had seen in a year. So that was really exciting, and to, it's just fun to interact with people again. Um, chips and salsa, no particular brand or place. I was really lucky because I had a couple people provide gifts, so I came home to a kitchen full of chips and salsa, which was really exciting, even some homemade salsa from some of my neighbor's friends. So it was really neat to see that people had kind of honed in on that and that, you know, the little things in life on Earth that we all take for granted were kind of the special things that I got to come home to. Andy Sirota with KPRC. This is a significant moment in, in history in all seriousness, and there are going to be a lot of young ladies out there who are going to look up to you from this point forward and say, you know what, I want to be you someday. I want to go further someday. What do you say to this next generation of female space explorers? Well, it is a great honor to know that that may be the case. And I've always said about any record that you set that my biggest hope is that it's exceeded as soon as possible. That means we're pushing the boundaries. More people are living to, up to their dreams and their potential. So my main message to anyone who has a dream is to follow your passions, be true to yourself, do what you love, and live the life that you've imagined for yourself. And then a couple things I like to throw in on that is do what scares you. Do the things that might feel like they're just out of your reach, they're intriguing you, they're drawing you in, but you don't know for sure if you can do it, go after that thing. Not only will you maximally impact the world, but you'll get the most personal fulfillment out of it and use that as a springboard to just keep doing the same thing. And then I also say support the people around you. When we all care about everyone's well-being, that everyone is pursuing the dreams that are important to them, we rise to whatever occasion is before us and we do so as a group. And again, it's the way we can give back maximal to the world and to you know relive our own potential to the max so those, that's my message to everyone and then you know I just feel like I also owe so much that so much to the people that inspired me back in the day to, to get to where I am so if any if there's any way I can feed that forward to the next generation it's really an honor to do that great question okay we'll take a few on the phone Tim Peeler Hello. 
Yes, go ahead. Senior NC State flag up there and your School of Science and Math. Can you talk about some of the experiences that you had at the space station that might have made you think back to NC State, back to your the fears you might have had as a student, experiments, anything like that? Definitely. So many things I think we relate back to that special period in our lives going away to college, finding, you know, new discoveries, learning things about ourselves, learning things about the world around us. So it was almost a, a constant experience of reliving some of those things. In particular, one thing that comes to mind is NC State is the place where I learned to rock climb and where I started pursuing that as a hobby. And that particular hobby has just lent itself so well to some of the challenges that I've faced in learning how to become an astronaut and mainly just that you can achieve things that seem unachievable at first and that you can believe in yourself and the teamwork aspects of that. So I constantly relied on that. There are some really neat parallels as well to spacewalking and rock climbing. So NC State is where I discovered that great hobby of mine. And then the teamwork that it took to do a lot of the projects that I took on as a physics student and electrical engineering student and, you know, working together on a team of people to achieve a common purpose and a common goal was something that I relied on a lot. So a lot of life lessons there. Did you do your first rock climbing at the Carmichael Gym, and, or where else did you go for that? Of course I did. And then, you know, we had our field trip out at Stone Mountain. So lots of North Carolina references there. All right, Sarah Grimmer. Yes, Sarah Grimmer from Grand Rapids in West Michigan. You know, Christina, kids all over the world are looking up to you right now, obviously, and especially kids in your hometown of Grand Rapids in West Michigan. Could you speak a little bit about your upbringing in West Michigan and some encouragement for those kids? Absolutely. I found that the spirit of hard work and taking care of each other and caring about each other that was, you know, given to me from the time I was very young from the people of West Michigan and my family there that are farmers was completely instrumental in me getting to where I am today. I worked in the fields with my grandparents and my uncles and, you know, some of the life lessons they taught me, the grit that I learned from how hard that they worked and the idea of just constantly giving and, you know, looking at each day as an opportunity to do as much as you can for the people around you and for the community around you. I think some of those kind of moral, um, you know, lighthouses that I learned from the time I was young in Grand Rapids and, in, you know, north of Grand Rapids and some of the farming areas there will just stay with me forever and I constantly rely on them. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Marsha Dunn. Um, Scott Kelly told us after his one-year mission that he, he had aching muscles and joints, burning skin, sore feet, and I'm wondering if you experienced any of that even fleetingly after a uh, touchdown, and then I had a follow-up. Well, I have been lucky in that I haven't experienced all of those things. You know, a little bit of muscle aching is definitely going to be across the board something that you experience when you have to use new muscles that you haven't learned to use in, you know, however long you've been in microgravity, whether in, in some ways even just a normal duration ISS mission. Um, we have great countermeasures so that we don't lose a lot of our bone and muscle mass like we may have done, you know, in decades past when we do long duration. But some of those fine stabilization muscles that you use just to do simple things like walking, we have lost. So I do notice little, you know, discovering muscles I haven't felt in a while and things like that. Haven't really had the sore feet, but I did notice for about a day I had my neck was sore and I felt like a two week old that I, you know, was actually working hard to hold up my own head. <laughs> um, but no, I've been very fortunate. It's been a pretty easy transition back and I have great teams that make sure that that happens. And, and I'm wondering, what day did you finally get to the beach? Did you manage to take a swim or is that like not allowed yet? And I'd like to hear more about your dog. What kind of a dog do you have and what's her name? And she must have been really excited to see you. I was able to make it to the beach on Sunday, and I think my athletic trainer knew that that was a big goal of mine because she kind of kept pushing me and saying, I think if you can get this done, I'll clear you to walk on the beach. So she knew that that was a big motivation for me. Um, my dog is, we call her LBD, Little Brown Dog. She's from the Humane Society, and she couldn't be sweeter. And yes, she was very excited. I was very excited. I'm not sure who was more excited to see the other. Um, but luckily, we have it all. We have footage of the whole thing. So I'm really happy that, um, you know, it's just a symbol of coming back to the, the people and places that you love to see your favorite animal. All right, John Cross. Uh 
Jim Bridenstine has said that the first woman on the moon is already in the astronaut office and will have had uh, spaceflight, spaceflight experience aboard the ISS. You spent more time there than any other female astronaut. Uh, what are your thoughts about Artemis and the possibility of becoming, or at least walking on the moon, or possibility of being the first woman on the moon? Well, it is certainly a very exciting time to be part of the NASA um, you know, family when we are looking to go back to the moon, to go in a different way, to go to stay, to go you know, for all and by all. So it's a privilege to be here at this time. Of course, uh, me or anyone in our office would be honored beyond measure to be a part of that mission and to, you know, again, carry people's dreams even farther into space exploration, to contribute to future missions, to go even deeper. So I like to say that I am just excited that I'll probably know the first woman and uh, the next man to walk on the surface of the moon, but any of us would be ready and honored to accept that mission if it were offered to us. All right. All right. Elizabeth Howell. Tina, congratulations. I'm interested in learning about how you managed your mental health during your mission. So as far as you feel comfortable speaking about it, um, how did you take care of yourself and what challenges did you face? Well, for me, it was really just about the kind of the, the mental cheerleading that you do to yourself. I, used, I always say, like, put something on repeat in your head that's going to be constructive. So don't ever think over and over again about something that brings you down. Make sure to put something, um, you know, in your mental space that, that brings you up. And for me, that was always focusing on what I had and not the things I didn't have. Focusing on the unique aspects of my life that one day I would just wish I could have back for a second. And every time you think about it from that perspective, you're done feeling Feeling, you know like you miss home you're just ready to take on the day you're ready to remember that because this is so so special you have to kind of meet that with a, an equally high level of engagement and you know your own personal best so really just thinking about it in that light um, I didn't have too much too many struggles thinking about you know the, the the months dragged on or anything like that I just made sure to appreciate every day all right Russell Towns Hi, my name is Russell Pound with Pacific Rim Media in Alaska. Hello, Christina. Hello, great to be with you. Great. Say, so what experiment do you think those of us back on Earth would be most surprised to learn about? And the follow-up, if, if you were to design your own, what would you explore? Both great questions. I think that some people are interested to learn that one of the things that we study in space is actually something that's so applicable on Earth that you almost wouldn't imagine it, and that is pharmaceutical development. There are, you know, how I like to think about it as to unlock some of these diseases that we all are looking for a cure for here on Earth. Often we have to understand the structure of the proteins that actually are, you know, enable those, those diseases. And sometimes those protein crystals don't grow as well on Earth. So if we grow them in microgravity, we have a leg up on understanding their structure and then a leg up on, you know, learning about the medications that we can develop to fight those things. And so it's just an amazing thing that something that's so applicable, so tangible in our lives can be best looked at and studied in microgravity. Um, honestly, all the experiments that they're doing up there are kind of the things that I am naturally drawn to as well. I'm a electrical engineer and physicist, so I love that there's a lot of physical science things. I also love computer programming, so I like the idea that in microgravity we can study things without what we might consider the boundary conditions of, my, of 1G, um, you know, things like capillary action, um, things that really allow us and the people investigating those things to kind of gain an edge in the industrial environment where we're really pushing the limits of how we can be efficient um, in manufacturing and things like that. So I kind of love those experiments as well. <laughs> That's great. You look good with the cookies, too. Yeah. Can't complain about the cookies. <laughs> All right, Thank next, you. William Haney. Uh, yeah, hi, Christina. I'm calling from Kalamazoo, Michigan, so another West Michigan native here. Um, I'm actually a meteorologist at one of the local uh, stations here, and, you know, I just was blown away by so many of the cool weather photos that you shared. Um, you know, I think that come to mind, Hurricane Dorian or the wildfires out in Australia. I was just wondering if there was one specific type of weather that was the most jaw-dropping to view from space. Hands down, it's got to be the clouds. I always, you know, had seen clouds from the vantage of an airplane or something like that and had no idea that on a planetary scale there could be so many patterns, so many things that, you know, you can see on literally 
a planetary scale. Um, one really neat thing was vortices that form, and so you can actually see like a wave pattern in some of the clouds when the winds go over certain islands and things like that. So recognizing that little things that we might be familiar with from, say, studying a wind tunnel or something like that also take place on these gigantic scales. And then that, in turn, helps you understand that some of these planetary processes that we're learning to understand to try and understand and develop policies for things like climate change are so important because there really is a whole other scale that we don't see from our perspective down here that you do see from up there. And this is really phenomenal. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Next is Lindsay Mukamal. Hi, Christina. This is Lindsay with Wood TV, also in West Michigan, based in Grand Rapids. And in following your journey, I saw that this is something you wanted to accomplish since you were five years old. So one thing I'd love to know is if you could go back and talk to yourself as that five-year-old who was so confident in becoming an astronaut, what would you have to say to her? Well, I, first of all, the five-year-old me was not necessarily confident that I would become an astronaut, but confident that I wanted to be an astronaut. So knowing that that was what I was passionate about was what I was sure of, but I also knew that the chances were really, really low. You know, I pursued it as a single-minded goal for many, many years. And then actually something interesting happened. I went away to space camp, and in part of our space camp class, we learned how to be an astronaut. It was actually the name of one of the classes we attended. And the instructor actually wrote a list up on the board of the things that you should do. And, you know, everyone was flying, writing notes. And, and I thought in that moment that I wasn't going to live my life according to a checklist. I was going to live according to my own passions. And if later in life I look back and I reflected upon the fact that the experiences I had gained, the skills I had gained, would allow me to contribute in a, in a great way to the space program that I held in such a high regard, only then would I ever apply to be an astronaut. And so I might tell myself a little earlier to sort of look at it that way because I think that breaking away from the single-mindedness of only astronaut really allowed me to excel and to find the things that I love. And interestingly, those things were the things that we talked about the most in my astronaut interviews, things like rock climbing, things like you know going to Antarctica. And I like to tell the story that I actually quit a perfectly good engineering job at NASA to pursue uh, work in the Antarctic, and that turned out to be one of the greatest experiences experiences that I had going into it that I continue to draw from. So I would say live your, according to your own passions and let those guide you and then kind of reflect back and see where you can contribute the most. Amazing. And when you embarked on this, did you know you'd be making history or did it have to be pointed out? And then what went through your head when you realized that? Definitely had to be pointed out. I, I don't, I'm not, you know, don't keep the stats on that stuff, but luckily other people do. And I think that pointing out those milestones you know, as much as I might not like to be the center of attention, I think it is important because it spreads the word on where we're at, state of the art, kind of in our human space exploration. And I think milestones provide motivation for people. So I think it's a good thing to recognize. I will never forget the moment that someone mentioned that there had not yet been an all-female spacewalk. It was actually at my very last spacewalk training event where I was getting qualified to do a spacewalk. And after all the debriefs and being told everything, you know, I should do better and the things I did okay, and things like that, someone, you know, we're kind of all walking out and someone said, has there ever been an all-female spacewalk? And this person knew that there had not, but they were bringing it up. And that was the first time it had really occurred to me that there was a chance of that happening. And it's really just because of the direction we're moving, my class of astronauts being half men and half women, and just, you know, having the population on board. And it's, it's just a matter of time before it was to happen. So that was the first time I thought about it, didn't really think about it again, because you know, our job is to do the mission that's in front of us. And I'm just fortunate that that was part of the mission, mainly just because I like that we're now beyond that point. We can keep pushing. All right. We'll wrap up here with one question from social media from Billy from Arletta Elementary. How did you feel when you first looked back at our planet? Well, I'll never forget that moment. I hadn't even reached the International Space Station yet. I was still on the Soyuz spacecraft. And we have little covers over our windows. And of course, we also go in and out of daylight and night, and depending on what side of the Earth we're on. So we're on our way up to the space station. It's about a six hour rendezvous. And it first occurs to me that I should look out my window. And I opened it up. and. Wouldn't you know, there was Earth, and it just looked exactly like you might see in the pictures, except way more brighter, 
way more real. And I literally exclaimed. I just said, oh, my goodness. And, of course, that's not the right thing to say in a spacecraft when, you know, you could be noticing anything not going well. <laughs> so the very next thing out of my mouth went to Nick and Alexi was, everything's okay. It's just Earth. And, um, <laughs> but it was, it was phenomenal. It was that moment where I realized that, you know, this was real and um, that, that I had left our planet. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today. That's all the time we have, unfortunately. I think we could listen to you for hours. But um, you can learn much more about Christina's mission on nasa.gov slash station. Thank you for joining us.